Um, thank you for coming. Uh, the timing is good because I am planning on doing a book on this subject, uh, and we'll see what you think, whether you think it should be a book or just a, a talk. Um, okay, so here's the origins of this project, uh, things done in government in the Obama administration. And here's some examples of things, some of them probably familiar. Uh, kids are directly certified in breakfasts and lunches where they don't have to sign up, so they're automatically defaulted into the program. Uh, there's a new fuel economy label. If you buy a new car 2017, you're gonna see it. It has clarity on the environmental consequences and it has uh, numbers with respect to annual fuel costs and expected savings. Uh, your credit card bill has some pretty clear disclosures. Uh, calorie labels are in McDonald's or coming and Subway too and chain movie theaters. So these are all nudges, meaning choice preserving interventions. Now, while there's uh, been a lot of action on this dimension, there's also a fear of this. So I was particularly struck in Berlin where uh, some terrific people who are in social science are nervous that certain kinds of choice preserving interventions actually allow government to be a kind of puppet master. And the fact that this concern is in one of the great democracies with a, a pretty distinctive history of fear of puppet masters, East Germany in particular, that's uh, noteworthy. Okay, so uh, public opinion is relevant. Uh, in democracies, we might find uh, the views of people to be a kind of permission slip, uh, and the question is what people actually think. So these remarks are gonna come in two parts. I'm going to give you a kind of straightforward overview of what uh, Americans, and you'll actually see what the world, or at least large part of the world, I hope in the fullness of time to know about the world, the United States and Europe at least, what uh, people there think about this stuff. And then I'm gonna tell you something that's uh, more exciting to me, even, and uh, complicated. So this is gonna be pretty straightforward. Okay, so here are five things that people really like. Uh, they like calorie labels. Uh, they like graphic warnings for cigarettes. Uh, they like automatic enrollment and savings. They even like a federal mandate to that effect. And what we're seeing for all of these interventions is bipartisan approval. So there are some significant difference between Republicans and Democrats, but the more noteworthy fact is Republicans majorities like this stuff, as do Democrats. Three of them have asterisks. Those are the things that US government has actually adopted. It's probably more noteworthy that a traffic light system for food with red, green, and yellow for health is something that Americans favor. And it's really noteworthy that automatic enrollment in green energy is something that Americans favor. Okay, educational campaigns designed to combat obesity, to reduce discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation, and to combat distracted driving are uh, things people are very upbeat about. So an emerging hypothesis here is that most people are quite supportive of nudges actually adopted or under consideration in the recent past, and this cuts across party lines. Okay, more popular educational campaigns. Uh, people favor a campaign to encourage giving to the Animal Welfare Society of America. A bare majority, but a, mere, a majority, that surprised me. Mandatory labeling of products with GMOs, overwhelming support, very significant support for uh, mandatory labeling of high levels of salt. So an emerging hypothesis is most people would be highly supportive of a lot of other nudges. These aren't things we're observing from the US government. Okay, you might think of choice architecture broadly as uh, changing the decision-making environment so as to encourage certain kinds of choices. 
A state requirement, and this is pretty aggressive, that grocery stores put healthy foods in prominent visible locations. Americans want that. A requirement that people say they want to be, whether they want to be organ donors when they get their driver's license. Overwhelming majority supports that. An idea that women's last name changes automatically on marriage. That would be unconstitutional, by the way, if it's limited to women. 58% uh, of Americans want that and it's identical as between men and women. Okay, so the emerging hypothesis, the third one, is to put the second one at the bottom of this slide. Most people would be highly supportive of a lot of other nudges in bold letters and cry it from the rooftops. We're getting a lot of support for stuff. Okay, here are five defaults that people dislike. Assuming on the federal census that people are Christians subject to opt out. 21% approval. Christians don't like this much. Assuming for voter registration that people are Democrats, subject to opt out. Even Democrats don't like that. Assuming that on la a marriage, men want to change their last name to that of their wives, only 17% of men and women. I tried really hard to find automatic charitable donations that a majority of Americans would approve. I couldn't find any. And my interest in this stems from an analogy to automatic savings programs, where we saw earlier that people like automatic enrollment and savings programs. They really want that. Um, and we know that automatic enrollment in a charitable giving program would be quite effective. Uh, people don't like that. Okay, there are a couple of hypotheses that I think these support. Uh, the hypotheses are coming, I promise, but not quite yet. Okay, here are five information or education campaigns that people reject. A newly elected president embarks on an educational campaign to convince people that criticism of his decisions is unpatriotic and a threat to national security. Americans don't like that. A campaign to encourage mothers of young children to stay home. People reject that in large numbers. By law, movie theaters have to run subliminal ads to combat smoking and overeating. 41% want that, that's amazingly high. It's supportive of a hypothesis we'll get to in a moment. Uh, a campaign, which I thought would get basically no approval, by which Americans are told you can change your gender if you want to. Only 41% of Americans support that. Still, 41% of Americans support that. That's maybe a surprise. Okay, I have a six hypothesis which is coming, I promise. Okay, what accounts for disapproval? Here are three dominant principles. It is sufficient for disapproval if the nudge is perceived to have illicit or illegitimate motive. Movies, of course, but motives. Uh, if there's religious or political favoritism, or efforts at self-insulation by a new president, people are going to oppose it. It is also a sufficient condition for disapproval if the nudge is inconsistent with people's values or interests. Hence, the default name change for women is disapproved. The default name change for women is approved on the ground that that's what people's values and interests reflect, uh, connect with. Okay, there's a third principle, which I, I didn't expect to find, but which I think is uh, of immense importance, which is that people think that losses of multiple kinds can occur only with explicit consent, and if there's a nudge by which a loss occurs without explicit consent, it's out of bounds. Okay, that is interestingly connected with a theory of contract called the consent theory of contract, you may have encountered it. I bet you've encountered it, even if not by that name, the consent theory of contract. Now, there is what I believe to be a kind of fundamental flaw in the consent theory of contract, which it, it has to depend on a theory of background entitlements, which it can't itself supply. So you have to consent to lose something, but where does the thing become yours? Where does that come from? Uh, that's a problem. That's a theoretical problem. I think what's happening in the data is people have a kind of very clear intuitive sense of what people's entitlements are 
And if the government is taking that from them without their explicit uh, authorization, it's illegitimate. That helps explain why Americans by majority do not like default donation of body parts at the time of death. You have to indicate whether you want that. And that explains why I failed in my multiple efforts to find a default charitable contribution that people will approve of. You might think with charitable contributions that there's someone else, something else at work, which is people think it's in the nature of charity to give it voluntarily. And it's not charitable if it just ends up giving by default. That probably accounts for some of the data, but my, uh, my hunch is that the real driver is it's their money. They don't lose it unless they say so. OK, note, if you would, that ideological contests are going to ar arise, at particularly from the first two. So we're not observing ideological contests in what I've described thus far, but we could easily generate them. Uh, so if you have an anti-abortion nudge, uh, people are going to disagree with whether that's consistent with the values or interests of relevant people. OK, what about partisanship? The evidence is often lower levels of R support than of D support. So you get R Democratic support of 80%, Republican support of 68%. That's statistically significant, but very large R support. Crudely, but it is true, some Rs oppose nudges as such, but not a whole lot. So I'm going to give you a little bit of data in a moment. Note that it is very easy to find nudges that R's like better than D's. And note that in Sweden, there is mildly higher levels of support for health and safety nudges than the United States. That's, I think, replicating the difference between R's and D's. But it's not you know, a huge deal. It's not like these are different political universes. OK. There is a finding, not in my data, but consistent with my data, of something called partisan nudge bias. It's super interesting. Here's how it goes. Suppose you give people an example of a nudge introduced by the Bush administration. Let's say it's a default rule involving savings. And then you ask people, do you like the this tool as a policy instrument? People who are Republicans will say, yes, I like that. People who are Democrats will say, no, I don't like that. Notice you're asking about the tool, not about the, the Bush administration initiative. Or you give people a, an Obama administration initiative, and then you say, do you like the tool? Republicans will say, no. Democrats will say, yes. That's interesting. It suggests that the judgment about the tool in general is driven by a quick assessment of who is the relevant actor likely to be. Now, while I said some R's oppose nudges as such, the likelihood that R's are going to be responsive to the political party or the name of the person associated with nudging, that is a much bigger driver of R judgments about nudges than this opposition by a, a small crew. Okay. What about the round, around the world? I have new data with a German co-author on Germany, the United Kingdom, Italy, France, Denmark, and Hungary. Now, notice that this is a very diverse group of nations. Hungary is, uh, uh, has distinctive traditions, is, was a communist nation not so long ago. Denmark has very strong social democratic traditions. Uh, Italy and France, uh, both Romance languages, but quite different cultures. The United Kingdom uh, is you know, unique, uh, and Germany has its own history. The basic story, I think stunningly, I did not expect this, is very similar to what we observe in the United States. So the tale I gave you of the three principal dominant principles and the particular answers on the various questions they're kind of the same. In Europe, political party is an extremely weak predictor of how people are going to re react to this stuff. There are only two distinctive wrinkles in the European data, and that is 
In Hungary and Denmark, the level of support for health and safety nudges is down about 12, 10 or 12 percent compared to everywhere else. Now, I think I understand what's happening in Hungary, that Hungarians are skeptical, skeptical as well as skeptical about their nation and they, their government and are not enthusiastic about these interventions. Uh, the Denmark data remains a puzzle. Okay, now I'm going to get to the, the new material, the material which is uh, uh, very complicated. Uh, and this gets at some very deep issues in legal and political theory. The issue is when you're thinking about an intervention from someone, do you want it to be something that increases your capacity for agency or do you want it to be something that just steers you in the right direction? So one way to think about it is when you're deciding among four options on something that you care about, do you want the relevant actor to provide you with, uh, to deluge with you with information such that you can make the best choice for yourself? Or do you want them to say something like, well, most people do B, or people like you tend to pick C, or if you want to do something other than C, you're going to have to uh, say so very clearly, otherwise you're going to get C. Which do you want? There are questions about welfare, and there are questions about agency. Okay, that's my son. Uh, his name is Declan. Uh, how many of you know about System 1 and System 2? Okay, uh, those of you who didn't know about, don't know about that distinction, your system one just was deflated and your system two just has a question mark. Do you now know about system one and system two? Okay, system one is the, is the part of the brain that, uh, or the mind maybe is a little more accurate, might be part of the brain too, which makes quick automatic intuitive judgments. You see a large dog coming into a room, and you might think, he's going to bite somebody. You're in a plane, and it starts to shake, and you think, we're all going to die. You wake up in the middle of the night in your home, and you know exactly how to get to the bathroom. System two things, planes don't crash, dogs are friendly, and system two might need to do some work if you're in a hotel room, you wake up in the middle of the night and need to go to the bathroom. System one is completely baffled. System two has to kind of figure it out. System one knows a smiling face. System two has to figure out what's 312 times 416. Okay, like any good father, I explained this to my son. <laughs> and I did so initially because whenever we pass a store that has toys, he says, let's go buy them, and I say no. And, and then I had to explain this to him. Is system one really wants more toys? Is system two knows he has plenty of toys? Uh, and he asked me just uh, a couple weeks ago, he said, Daddy, do I even have a system two? <laughs> OK, uh, here are uh, two choices. Uh, now, what I'm asking people to try to say is whether they want a system one nudge or a system two nudge, a nudge that educates them or a nudge that steers them. Okay, the first one, the system one nudge, is a graphic warning as part of an anti-smoking campaign. The system two nudge is purely factual information. Okay, you're going to recognize a pattern here. Now, there are questions to ask about whether this is pure educative, non-educative. Work with me if you would, and notice the two is flooding people with information, and one is basically trying to make some part of their brain turn red. Okay, do you want to encourage people to save for retirement automatic enrollment and savings plans subject to opt out? We know Americans generally like that, so do Germans. Or do you want financially literacy programs so that people are educated? Uh, number three, do you like automatic enrollment in slightly more expensive green energy? That's a non-educative nudge, subject to opt out, or educational campaign so consumers can learn the advantages of green energy. And just one more, this is the 
the neutral condition, as we'll call it. Hotel rooms are required to select a default policy of environment-friendly rooms in which towels are not washed. If you want daily washing, you have to call up. Versus number two, the hotels have to provide guests with information about an environmentally friendly policy, and they get to take part or not if they want. They're educated. So these are four pretty simple standard examples drawn from real world practices asking America, what do you think? And notice, if you would, that this is going to be a between subjects test in the sense we're going to have multiple conditions, and everyone in the survey is participating in only one condition. They're not seeing any other condition. So a bunch of people nationally represented are seeing all four of the questions you've just seen. Okay, here are the results. Uh, basically, between a quarter and two-fifths wants the system one nudge. So the basic upshot is most Americans want the educative nudge. That's what they favor. Uh, not overwhelming majority, but definite majority in each of the four questions. That seems to be the pattern. Okay, what if you tell people that the system one nudge is significantly more effective? Now, the reason this is a noteworthy uh, difference is that what I'm trying to do here is figure out, is the population that favors the system two nudge, are they welfareists who think that system two nudges have better consequences, or are they Kantians? who think that system two nudges are more respectful of people's autonomy. And notice what you get is a jump, a definite jump in the direction of the system one nudge, but it's relatively modest. It looks like it's kind of lockstep. You get across different questions a 10 to 12% uh, jump, almost identical. I'd like it to be an iron law that people, the 10 to 12% of the population will jump across a wide range of circumstances, which would suggest that there are a bunch of people out there real, who really are welfareists, and there are others who are pretty strong autonomy types. Okay, because this is relatively modest, I thought I should ask them another, I should have another condition, and note that this is another, also nationally representative, but different people, in which I give them numbers. So they're told it's significantly more effective, but they're given very powerful numbers. Not crazy powerful numbers, but numbers like with financial literacy, you get a 20% increase in enrollment and savings plans. With automatic enrollment, you get a 60% increase. So you get very dramatic numbers. Now here's the first result, which I hope you will take as baffling. When people are told that the system one nudge is significantly more effective with quantification, you get identical results as when you don't supply the numbers. That's baffling. That shouldn't be. Okay, we're gonna to try to explain why it happened. I have, an, I have a potential explanation, but that is uh, highly unanticipated. Okay, condition four, people are told that system two nudge is significantly more effective with numbers. So they're told with financial literacy, you get 60% of people in the program with automatic enrollment, you get a jump of 20%. Basically looks like that. And here's the second puzzle. It's the same as the neutral condition. It's essentially identical. That's weird. It should be that when they're told system two nudge is significantly more effective, there's a rush to the system two nudge because on Kantian grounds it's preferred and on utilitarian grounds it's preferred too but that's not what happened. Okay, that's a puzzle. Okay, so this is what we have, basically the picture. Uh, the first two bullets are straightforward. People like educated nudges by majority. A sizable minority doesn't. We don't know exactly why. There's a 10 to 14% shift when they're told the non-educative is more effective. Uh, with quantification, we get the same result. When the educative is significantly more effective, it's the same as the neutral condition. Okay, basically, in terms of politics, in the earlier survey I told you about, ours are somewhat more enthusiastic, less enthusiastic about health and safety nudges and Ds. Here, we basically got nothing. Rs and Ds are the same. Americans, whatever they disagree on, they look across partisan lines. Uh, whether you like Sanders or Trump, 
you're exactly the same on these questions. Okay, um, okay. One question to ask is whether people's judgments in the preference test, which is all you've heard so far, is an artifact of their judgments about what they believe is more effective. So I asked a group on Amazon's Mechanical Turk, which on these questions looks about the same as the nationally representative survey, exactly that question. Now we get a flip, meaning that Americans believe the system one nudge is more effective in every single case, even though Americans prefer in every case the system two nudge. That's noteworthy. That suggests that the disparity between the slide you're looking at and the neutral condition is driven by a preference for agency as such. That's a driver. Okay, so a substantial number of people prefer the system to nudge even though they think it's less effective. And a substantial number like the system new touch because, because they think it's more effective. So we have agency matters a lot and welfare is all that matters people. Okay, because the results just described leave two puzzles, I thought I need to do another survey in which it's within subjects rather than between subjects, meaning people see, the same people see all four conditions. So this is a large population, not nationally representative on MTurk, but it looks the same as the nationally representative in which people are given all four conditions. And this is looking much more orderly, isn't it? Okay, if you look at the first two panels, the neutral condition and told the system one nudge is significantly more effective, it's basically the same as what you saw before. That is, the majority likes the system two nudge. There's a switch in the direction of system one nudge. It's not huge, but it's quite significant. When people are told, given the numbers in the within subjects comparison, then there's a further jump of a minimum of 10% and a maximum of 14, 19%. So significant jump. Now that's what you'd expect, which shows, I think, that the reason column two and column three in the between subjects condition had no difference is that people didn't know how to evaluate the, the quantification in a vacuum. They just saw the numbers and that's, that's significantly more effective. That doesn't tell me anything. Once they see the two in comparison, the numbers start to speak loudly. That's why you see the shift. When they're told that the system two nudge is significantly more effective, then you're getting much smaller support for the system two nudge. So that's what you'd expect. And in the between subjects condition, remember we didn't get that. So I think they're able to evaluate it. There's uh, some puzzles here though, which is why is it that uh, 30 to 28, 19, 21% are for the system one nudge, even when they know it's significantly less effective. Why is that? The preference for the system two nudge is intelligible. The preference for the system one nudge is a bit of a mystery. Okay, uh, having given the people standard problems, I decided I would give them some problems that are kind of exotic. Uh, they have special characteristics. Two of them involve constitutional rights and one of them involves kids. So what do you think of an educative nudge for voting to encourage people to register versus automatic registration? 57% want the non-educative. That's the first one we've seen where the majority wants the non-educative. Why is that? For abortion, there is overwhelming opposition to the non-educative nudge. So 75% of people want mothers to be educated about the fetus and what its status is, more than wanting a graphic presentation of the fetus to discourage abortion. Now I think what's noteworthy about that, it's, it's a more subtle point that I had understood when I asked the question. I think it's pretty interesting. It's that when people really oppose the action in question, that is the conduct, they will be more receptive to a system one nudge. 
when they think the action in question is one that people are entitled to engage in, then they will hate the system one nudge. So there's a moral judgment here, which is that people's claim for autonomy is very strong in circumstances in which they're perfectly entitled to decide to go the way that the choice architect doesn't like. If it's a question that has a pretty clear answer, then the system one nudge is more appealing. For kids, a majority wants the cafeteria design. They don't want to educate the parents. And that, I think, is not a shocker. It's actually with children, a system one nudge is something people like. OK, um, what's more effective? People believe in each of these cases that the system one nudge is lots more effective. But there's one anomaly here, a weird thing, which is they think a discussion with the doctor where women are informed is more effective in reducing abortion than is a graphic warning with a fetus. I think that's not a credible uh, answer, that the answer more effective means I like it better, uh, not that people believe it's more effective. Okay, uh, baffled by the tenacious interest in system two nudges, even in circumstances in which it's much more effective, that shouldn't be, no one should want that. And baffled equally by the relatively modest flip to system one nudges when people are told with numbers that the system one nudge is much more effective I decided basically to go a little crazy and to give people very extreme numbers. To say with a graphic warning for cigarettes, just assume hypothetically that you will save 30,000 lives a year. And with information, you'll save 300 lives a year. You'll get 90% of people at a pension plan with automatic enrollment and 10% in with literacy. Crazy disparities. Okay, with crazy disparities, we get a 25% shift basically toward the system one nudge. Much bigger than with dramatic number, than with significant numbers. But not, not everybody. So people will go from 45% to 70% for the system one nudge. That's a big shift. Uh, there's a but there, which is tenacious hold on the system to nudge, even in the face of crazy numbers. Those must be strong Kantians, yes? Then I gave people similarly, identically dramatic numbers for the system to nudge, and then you get basically the same magnitude of shift in the direction of the system to nudge, 25% on average. But still, about a fifth of people are favoring the system one nudge. Why is that? It's either something pretty fancy, which we'll get to, or it's just noisy responses. People are just you know, mad or distracted or something. I'm not sure. OK, so here are two hypotheses that I hoped this project would support in the fullness of time, maybe. I wanted to call it System 1 Prefers System 2 Nudges. Got it? I believe that's true. System 1 likes System 2 Nudges. We have an automatic intuitive preference for an educative rather than a non-educative nudge. That's what Americans are like. I believe that's true, but my data doesn't prove it. The reason I believe it's true is connected with some work on morality, which suggests that system one is Kantian. We have quick intuitive support for uh, treat people as ends, not means. System two is much more utilitarian, that if people are slower and more deliberative, they start thinking, you know, what are the consequences? But if they're thinking quick, they think, do the right thing. OK, having failed with that hypothesis, meaning it's unproved, it's tempting to have a different title. System 2 prefers System 1 nudges, which I think it would be lovely to think. But it's also not proved by my data. 
and it's probably false. System two will often want the system two nudge. Okay, now we're gonna get all system two. So here's some normative analysis, system two time. Welfareists would have no systematic reason to prefer one nudge to the other. Everything turns on costs and benefits. It's true second order considerations could support one or another. It might be that the preference for system one nudges is that they're a lot cheaper and simpler to implement. So if you say everybody at a big firm is gonna be automatically enrolled in a pension plan, we can do that easy and tomorrow. A literacy program to set up, it's a complicated apparatus, yes? So it might be that the people who are supporting system one nudges, remember I said they might be fancy people, they are thinking exactly this. It's doubtful though, isn't it, that in a survey setting that this level of elaboration is going to be the driver of judgments, maybe. Okay, welfareists would also want to ask about the long-term effects of a nudge Maybe a system two nudge would educate people and benefit them in multiple domains of their lives. If so, it would have collateral benefits that could turn out to be a big deal. Like if you get financial literacy, you're not just gonna make a good choice for your pension plan, you're gonna know a lot. People might be thinking that too. That might drive the preference for system two nudges. Uh, it's doubtful. Pretty complicated for a survey setting. It's true though. Okay, if we're not welfareists and we believe that for reasons involving dignity or autonomy, people ought to be active agents, affirmatively responsible for the outcomes that affect their lives, that's kind of could be turned into soaring rhetoric. I'm a little more ambivalent about it right now. I was in a cab yesterday morning early and as is standard in New York, the cab driver said, which way should I go to the airport? And I had to restrain my temper because <laughs> it's early in the morning and I didn't want to have to think, how do I get to the airport? He's the driver, he should decide. <laughs> okay, that was kind of not very nice of me to have to restrain my temper. I succeeded, I'm proud to say, but I was not affirmatively responsible for the outcome that affected my life and that I think is uh, revealing because in multiple domains we benefit from not being active agents and being able to focus on our concerns and what we care about. If we had to author the narrative of our lives with respect to everything that affects us, uh, we wouldn't be able to allocate our attention where we want to, that would be a problem. But there's a judgment here which is it's more respectful to people and best to inform them and let them choose than to kind of uh, provide a path of least resistance. So on that view, what's wrong with paternalism, even of the choice preserving kind, is that it insults people's capacity for agency. Maybe it shows a form of disrespect. Why not educate people rather than enrolling them in a program that the government or a company thinks is in their interest? That's very plausibly a driver of the judgments that we're seeing from Americans. Yes, the majorities are probably thinking something like that. That also, by the way, I think is the core of the ethical objection to manipulation. So if you have a friend or a family member or a life partner or an employer or a government who's manip manipulating you, you might think that the best thing they should do if they want you to go in a certain direction is to increase your capacity for agency rather than to manipulate you, that it's treating you disrespectfully. And if you're a welfareist, you might think if they're treating you as an object of manipulation, there's a kind of clue that they are not promoting your interests but their own so John Stuart Mill's harm principle, which says the only basis for intervention is harm to others, I think is uh, naturally plugged in to the welfareist objection to manipulation, where the Mill claim 
the foundation for Mill's claim is you know what's best for you, and a third party doesn't. Therefore, you get to decide. And a manipulator is subject to the same concern. The manipulator should tell you stuff, and they'll let you decide. That's likely to promote your welfare. OK, the world can be divided into three kinds of people. Some people who are kind of uh, thoroughgoing welfareists who agree that automatic enrollment, if it's better on welfare grounds, uh, is preferred. But they want the government to meet the demonstration, make the demonstration that it's better. So they're kind of welfareists w with a little distrust of government. Others are, let's call them presumptive Kantians, who have a presumption in favor of educative approaches, but they demand an exceptionally strong showing of higher net benefits. So they're Kantians with a utilitarian override. And still others, fanatics, we can call them with respect, might believe that in some circumstances, no demonstration could justify a non-educative nudge. And the data suggest Americans fall in these three categories. And the various tests about effectiveness are eliciting which categories people fall in. OK, uh, my view is that an all things considered welfareist analysis is the right way to go. That the economic analysis of law has had 1,001 good insights, but only one great insight. And the single great insight is that when you're stuck, uh, consider the costs of decisions and the costs of errors. So uh, a, a widely generalizable framework. It may not be the whole territory here, but it's probably most of it. Thanks. So help with the book, if you would. Sure. I would, I would suggest that a lot of the um, resistance to the strongest kinds of nudging that you're calling system one, I think, uh, comes from the fact that many of us have had personal experience with people who are not satisfied with choice preserving nudging but are apt to go to requirements and prohibitions. Uh, I think I'm as good a conservationist as most people. I resent the fact that in a single toilet household, and there are still plenty of them of the, in this country, you can no longer get a standard flow toilet. Can and I can stop you there if I might and say yeah. that, uh, that, that notice that the system one nudges they are attracting very widespread support. So the basic upshot of the first part of the talk is you get overwhelming support in all democratic nations for system one nudges, so long as people think the end is legitimate and the, um, and the values and interests of the choosers are being respected, and there isn't some loss being imposed of dollars or bodies. So the basic tale is system one nudges are super popular. In a pairwise comparison, people prefer the system two nudge to the system one nudge. But in some work that I haven't told you about, I ask people, do you want the system one nudge, the system two nudge, or both? And both is often the plurality winner. So people do not oppose the system one nudge. I've worked very hard to find something like what you're describing, and I've mostly failed. The only one where I succeed in getting you know, very strong majority opposition to a system one nudge is subliminal advertising. That's system one you know, in, of a very um, unfair kind, because people aren't even conscious. But in various countries, you get strong majority, minority support for that, so long as the end is OK, if it's about you know, smoking. Subliminal advertising for smoking, 40% of Americans are for that. Whoa. And I tried to get, uh, I, I didn't tell you about one. I tried, uh, uh, I created a very offensive, and if you're a certain kind of mood, funny also, but very offensive. Uh, uh, educational campaign about childhood obesity. And it was you know, so over the top 
that you can't imagine it on television with you know, people looking, kids looking into the camera saying, obesity is the curse of my life. I mean, it's so ridiculous as well as offensive. And I constructed it so that people would oppose it. They like it. <laughs> yes, I would say that analyzing particularly the, the two distinctions. Thanks. The two distinctions uh, between smoking and abortion. I see that. I think the main issue, as you noticed when you asked, you know, do you think a conversation with a doctor, a graphic representation would be better? I think you really highlighted a point that's very true in that we want to think that a conversation with a doctor would help. Uh, having seen kind of graphic representations of kind of a, an unborn child at two weeks, it has hands and feet. And this is something that a woman who takes the RU40 pill could see in the toilet if she's not at the hospital at the time that it takes effect. These are things that you know, we know would convince people because the information is very ambiguous. So we really don't have to kind of confront the idea of convincing anyone because, you know, we're very, we're trained to ignore information that we don't want. I think we, we're afraid of having our opinion changed because we're not in the mood to have our opinion changed. And I see that with smoking, it's a complete opposite. We're saying, yeah, let's put a graphic representation. Let's, you know, do all these things that have a visceral response in people. But it's only because everyone's in agreement that smoking is bad. We've come from you know, a society where doctors were recommending to smoke to a society now where so many people lost so many loved ones to smoking that we're all convinced of it. So I think, well, what's the point of the nudge? If we're all convinced that smoking is bad, yes, there's a few people who'll be a little more convinced uh, day to day seeing that image on the carton, but we're investing so much money into it. I mean, even Australia went as far as investing money in finding the most disgusting color and using that to be on their, their, their boxes. I, I, there, why would the government invest so much money in all these things when we see that it really needs to be a grassroots effort of people just being educated and changing their opinion? Because if they don't want to change their opinion, they're going to have opposition to someone trying. Why, why even enter the battle? Okay, so there's a couple different points there. I mean, I, if I heard you right, the suggestion is that for abortion, people don't want the graphic warning if they are pro-choice because they think this is kind of too what is it, uh, too unfair or uh, tendentious a way of discouraging. Uh, but for smoking, they want it because they don't think people should smoke. The data is not consistent with that. Americans, 55% prefer the educative to the graphic uh, in the neutral condition. And even under the significantly more effective condition, you get you know, a modest majority supported. So Americans don't want the they like the graphic warning, but in a pairwise comparison, they, com they, they would want the education. So that's interesting. That suggests even in this domain, Americans are pro-agency types. Now, the majority is going to flip when they get effectiveness information. Now, in terms of what to do about smoking, that's, that's kind of a different issue from what's here, um, though my last slides kind of got at it. Uh, the, I think we have to figure out what our you know, theory of the case is, if, if we're cost-benefit people and we think that uh, the question is what way are we going to increase aggregate welfare, then if a graphic warning campaign and among the various expensive things the Australian government does, finding a disgusting color, it's not that expensive, <laughs> right? If you go crazy on some air pollution thing, it might be a good thing to do, but that's going to be very expensive. Finding a color, the Australians can do that. So the costs of these uh, interventions aren't, in the scheme of things, that high. They might not be worth incurring. It depends on what the benefits are. So on the welfareist view, go for it with graphic warning if you save a significant number of lives. The Australians believe they will do that. So Australia, my understanding is the, the death toll, the smoking incidence has gone down significantly. In terms of public health problems, by the way, over 400,000 Americans die every year uh, as a result of smoking. And I, I think as I say that, that's a cold number. But uh, I personally know two people who died young because of smoking and if you don't, you will, and that's not a cold fact. So, you know, 
the two people I'm talking about are people I loved, and you can, you know, can save those people. <clears throat> yeah. Um, I think that also the there's there's a, a, a big discrepancy in partly like the way that the questions are phrased in terms of um, what like what people prefer and also what are the real world implications of X, Y, and Z actions. Like for example, when it comes to the graphic depiction of smoking, that's a decision that people can opt out of or opt into actually every single day. They can either opt into obeying the graphic depiction or they can ignore it and buy a pack of cigarettes. Like whereas when you're talking about the, um, when you're talking about f like financial nudges, when you're talking about people opting into savings and opting out of those things, those are actually very, like they seem like very difficult to opt in or opt out of. Then they wouldn't be nudges anymore. So the built into the default rules, you're right, people may not understand that, but in actual practice, it's got to be easier, it's not a nudge. Is that is that the way that those questions were presented, though? The idea I, that like you that raise a, you, you raise a good point. Uh, I had I had understood it that way. I don't know. The fact that strong majority of Americans and all these Europeans favor automatic enrollment. With, I think it says with easy opt, uh, easy opt out. Mm -hmm. So uh, I know in the first part. The, I'm pretty sure that's how it was phrased in the. Uh, uh, it, it didn't say easy, it said opt out. But in the other questions with which I started, easy opt out, people favor it. You're right, you should get a difference. So you're making a good point. Uh, to, the, to the point raised earlier about mandates, by the way, and this supports what you're saying, Americans oppose mandates even if they like the direction in which people are being mandated. So Americans do not favor or oppose nudges as such. They do oppose mandates as such. I have to be a little careful about this because with respect to you know, theft, they want that to be mandated against. With Social Security, they don't have a problem with the mandate majority. But uh, you're raising a very good point whether this is picking up on a thought that default rules are, uh, are gonna be hard to opt out of. But the fact that you get such strong support uh, in the neutral condition and it shifts to majority support with respect to savings, the significant more effective condition, suggests that people see, if you don't like it, you can get out of it. Last question. Thank you so much. I'm wondering if there's a difference among age groups or generations. So, for example, the generation that lived through the Cold War versus us who haven't, if that changes how people are thinking about this. It's a great question. And I'll tell you a hypothesis that I was sure was true, which is that in Germany, the East Germans would be more negative about um, nudges than the West Ger former West Germans because they lived under communism. I was sure of that. So was my German co-author. Not so. We got no demographic differences in Europe with one exception, there's a modest tendency for women to like health and safety nudges more than men. But no other demographic differences mattered. And in the United States, basically, it uh, didn't get much. I, th I think I recall that uh, African Americans are more upbeat about nudges than Caucasians. That Caucasians like them, but African Americans like them a bit more. Um, but uh, the age, not getting much. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thanks.